please join me in welcoming Deb Perlman to the stage. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a total Google dork. I am. Uh, I um, I actually do, I run my entire life from Google Documents. Like it's actually like what my inside of my brain looks like. I have like this series of I sound kind of weird. Everything basically everything that I ever need to remember I have to pull up on a Google Doc. So yes, I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> anyway, so thank you. And um, this uh, this fall, uh, Smitten Kitchen turned six years old. It would be a first grader. It would be talking back, which seems about appropriate for <laughs> me being up here. Um, and I'm often asked how I got the site started, but I, I tend to drag my feet. I know that bloggers are supposed to like to talk about themselves, but I hate it. I think it's really awkward. <laughs> um, because basically my life story is I like to cook, I wrote a book, the end. <laughs> um, but I suppose you'd like to hear a little bit more than that. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna tell you just like this much more. And then what I love to do is a, um, answer questions because I love ask, I love answering questions. I think it's way more interesting. So um, anyway, when I registered uh, the domain name Smitten Kitchen in the summer of 2006, I um, actually expected it to be a six-month endeavor. I um, imagine that was about how long most blogs lasted, and I didn't expect this one to last because. I read a lot of food blogs at the time. Um, there were a bunch. Um, I read Am Adam Roberts' Amateur Gourmet and Lisa Fain's Homesick Texan. And what each blog I read had in common was that they have, they have an angle. They have a story they're telling about Texan food that you miss or teaching yourself how to be a gourmet chef. And I don't have an angle. I just like to cook. And so I didn't imagine that the blog would last. Um, but I do remember what I was looking for. And um, Google actually comes into play here, too. <laughs> because I remember very early on in the site, I wanted to make a birthday cake for a friend. And I knew exactly what kind of birthday cake I wanted to make. I wanted to make one of those yellow, layer, buttery, vanilla-scented, plush birthday cakes for a friend. And I didn't have a go-to recipe for it. I was somebody who liked to cook, but I didn't have these go-to recipes, and I decided to Google best birthday cake, and 1,670,000 results appeared. You guys don't seem remotely surprised by this. <laughs> I guess you know that. And I, I had no idea where to start, so I started with the first one, <laughs> and it was okay. It was fine. It was good. I mean, it probably would have been good enough, but I'm really picky, and I wanted to do something different with it. I wanted to use buttermilk. I wanted to, like, I had all of these ideas um, for birthday cake, and it wasn't that one. So I got to fiddling with it, and I ended up coming up with a cake that I thought I wanted people to get to first, and I wanted to share that with people because as much as I love and adore Google, I didn't want it to be this huge recipe roulette when you are trying to figure out what to make for dinner or when you want to make birthday cake. Most birthday cakes are made pretty much at like, what, 11 p.m., the night before your husband or kid's birthday party, and you're just hoping to get it right the first time. Um, you guys seem like really nice people, but I don't think that you're going to apologize if the cake is a disaster and it slumps on the floor at 2 in the morning. So anyway. Um, so I knew what kind of recipes I wanted to make, but at the time I was um, I was an IT reporter. <laughs> oh boy, if I haven't put you to sleep yet, I should tell you guys about my days being an IT reporter. Oh boy, I have no idea what I was doing as an IT reporter. If you met some of my former coworkers, they would be really nice about things, but they would be like, we have no idea what she was doing as an IT reporter either. <laughs> I had no business writing about IT or reporting, but nevertheless, it was my job, and it was one of many iterations of my so-called career to date. I've also been an art therapist. I have been a barista. I used to write happy birthday on bakery cakes in high school. I've taught swim lessons. I have swirled frozen custard after college classes. I've had a lot of weird jobs. I wouldn't say that I've been particularly good at any of them. <laughs> but they're what I did. Um, and I think what's even more kind of improbable or illogical is that I decided I wanted to start this food site because as I've made clear, I don't know a whole lot about writing. <laughs> 
And my kitchen is about the size of, like this is probably my entire kitchen counter right here. I have this tiny Manhattan kitchen, something I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. And um, I am not a photographer. I do not know what half the buttons on my camera do. <laughs> um, I just kind of just play around until I um, get what I'm looking for or not close enough. And um, I've never really learned to write properly. I never went to journalism school or anything. In fact, this entire talk has been one long run-on sentence so far. <laughs> but I wanted, to, I wanted to start this site. And um, I remember the thing that happened very early on, the thing that kind of changed it for me was I remember very early on I shared a recipe and someone said, they left me a comment. And they were like, I made your recipe last night. I was like, mine? <laughs> You made mine. You like you had like one hour of free time after putting your kid to bed, and groceries are expensive, and you don't know anything about me. And you made this recipe. I was completely flattered and very humbled and utterly terrified. I realized that if people were going to spend their time, I mean, actually making these recipes, I better start knowing what I'm doing quickly. <laughs> time to start figuring it out. Um, so. Um, that was around the time, you know, after one comment, there became more and more. And what was happening in the comments is that people were asking me questions because I had mistakenly given them imp the impression that I knew what I was doing. People would ask me, like, can I use cake flour instead of regular flour? What if I only have salted butter, not unsalted? And what if I only have ex extra large eggs? Ina Garten only uses ex extra large eggs, and you only use large eggs. And what am I supposed to do? So people would ask me all of these crazy questions, and I would scramble to get answers because you know, they were there, and I wanted to help. And I actually feel that over the years, answering all of these questions have really helped me become a better cook, that it was the comments, it was the readers asking these things that I had to figure out the answer to that um, really um, helped. Anyway, um, so I started the, the site in the fall of 2006. And in 2008, I quit my day job. I'm sure they were like, see you later. <laughs> Don't let the door hit you. <laughs> um, but I quit my day, and it was utterly, like, it was completely terrifying, as I'm sure, as if any of you have ever experienced the deciding that you, you do not need your safety net anymore. Um, but I think it was actually really good for me, because it really gave me permission to start working on the kind of recipes I wanted to work on. I'd been sort of fumbling along on this site, but now I had, like, this grant to start creating the kind of recipes I wanted to each day. And it was really fun for me. Um, and I, I think the site probably took off a bit more after then. <laughs> anyway, um, if you cook lunch for your friends today and you make them like a really great like roast chicken and a salad and whatever else you do, it's going to be amazing because you're an amazing cook. And your friends are going to go, oh my god, this is the best roast chicken I've ever had in my entire life. And I love this. And you should open a restaurant. <laughs> Because this is what people do. They say you should open a restaurant. And I think it, I just, with all due respect, I think it's a terrible idea. I think that opening a restaurant because you cook chicken well is a really bad idea. And a similar thing happens when you have a food blog that has more than two comments a day. People say, you should write a cookbook. And I said, oh, absolutely not. I think writing a cookbook is the worst idea in the entire world. And I will never, ever, ever write a cookbook. The end. <laughs> um, but that kept happening. And I kept saying no. And that went on for about another two or three years. And um, it would have stayed that way. And I would not be probably standing here today. But what happened was, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to say this, but I got pregnant. And I, I know it's sort of cheesy, but like I, it kind of becoming a parent sort of shifted my paradigm a little bit. And I, OK, it was the hormones. Um, so <laughs> I was like, my baby's never going to know what I do when he grows up. Like, I, I was like, he can't hold a website in his hand. He, doesn't, he won't know what I did, and like, he'll never know about these meals. And what if this website, I get tired of doing it, and then I don't do it anyway. So very, very logical, rational um, line of thought led me to deciding that I was going to write a book. Um, 
But it wasn't just that simple. I um, was still, despite saying, okay, maybe I'll write a book, I was still a little resistant to the idea. I'm so in love with the web format. I wasn't one of these people who was just like, oh, I have a blog and I hope I get a book deal. Like I was like, I have a blog and I hope if I write a book it doesn't ruin the site. Because I really feel like I love doing the site. I love, um, I love being able to write long introductions. Like you can't really fit those in books. I like to be able to talk for as long as I want. Um, as you can see. I love um, being able to add process photos. You know, most cookbooks, they just show you a final shot, if, if even one, and it looks really pretty, but I don't think it helps people as much cook that recipe as a few details from the recipe, like what the onions look like when you chop them, or what the frosting texture is going to be on the beaters. I think those things really help, and I wanted the cookbook to include that. And I really like comments on websites. I really, and I don't, I didn't know how I was going to be able to have those in a paper book, and I still don't actually. Um, so I had this whole crazy list of rules for the book that I basically wrote knowing that nobody was ever going to agree to them, and I'd never actually have to write the book. Um, that was my great, really professional plan. <laughs> and the first one was that I wanted to have these longer intros. I wanted to have as many process photos as possible. I wanted to have, I wanted, although it was going to be called the Smitten Kitchen Cookbook, I didn't want it to just have recipes from the site. I wanted it to be mostly new, and the book is, in fact, 85% new re recipes. I didn't want people to like buy a book that they could just get for free online. It seemed kind of insulting to ask people to do that. Um, and then, you know, as if I hadn't had a ridiculous enough list of demands, I'd heard about this thing called lay flat binding. You know, when you're in the kitchen and you have a cookbook open and it closes on you, I didn't want it to do that. I think I'm like the first author ever that came to a publisher and said, and here's the kind of binding I want. I mean, I was really trying to get them to say no, and it didn't work, <laughs> which is why I'm here. <laughs> um, the last harebrained idea I had was that I thought, um, even though I was about to have a newborn and I'd never written a book before and I have this full-time job which is taking care of my website, no big deal, I was going to write the book in six months because isn't that like a normal amount of time to write a book? So I was absolutely insistent that I was going to finish it in six months and I insisted that they put it in the contract and everything. So that was really great. So three years later, <laughs> the book is here. Um, I kind of like to call it my second baby <laughs> at um, 336 pages and 2.8 pounds. I think she's a beaut, and I dedicated her to my first baby. Um, and now I would be happy to answer any questions you have, almost any, most questions. I will not answer the question of when I'm going to have another kid, because I know my mom put you up to it, and she's totally busted. <laughs> oh, what? Oh, you want me to... Oh, use the mic over there or over there? Awesome, if you want to um, ask a question. Or heckle me. Heckling is fine. I, I can handle it. <laughs> um, I have a question. Yeah. Hi. I'm Melissa. Um, I love your blog Thank so you. much. I've gotten away with, like, people think that I'm an amazing cook and I'm not because you are an it's amazing so cook. explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess... One, with the photos, how do you do the photos if you don't think of yourself as a photographer? Because I think that's a really rich part of the site. And also, when did you, what was the catalyst to sort of decide that you wanted to make the leap besides just like disenchantment with your old job and interest in this? Um, so um, Melissa asked about the photos. And I, I really do consider myself a photography hack. I mean, there are people who can have very serious conversations about lighting and scrims and aperture, and I'm like, I'm just like reading those words from my head, like I don't even know what half of them mean. So I really just kind of fiddle around. I like working by window, you know, natural light makes things easy. I, um, I use a DSLR and I, I use a 50 millimeter lens, which is often considered a portrait lens, because I really like to take sharp pictures. I know what I want the photos to look like. I'm just not, like the difference I think is a professional photographer can make it happen and I just kind of hope it happens. <laughs> Cross my fingers, maybe today will be the day I get the shot I want. But um, I mostly just take photos as I'm working. I keep the camera right outside the kitchen on a shelf um, one foot higher than my son can reach. 
and um, I just usually just grab it. And I just, I've gotten the habit of just taking photos at almost every step, um, just because I find that if I don't, it will be the time that it worked out perfectly the first time. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, um, but I just, I just, um, I, I like use autofocus. I mean, I'm such a hack. <laughs> Um, and your other, you had asked about how I knew it was time to make the leap. Well, I, um, I've always had ads on my site. Um, I try to keep them small and subtle. I like people who come to the site to know that they're more important than the little stuff in the sidebar. Um, but I've always um, had ad earnings. And basically, as the site grew, um, the ad earnings grew. And because I was like the worst like reporter in the world, I had basically no salary to speak of. So <laughs> getting um, one, the outside salary to match the job salary was not quite the process it would be if you had like a real job. Um, so for me, it was really just about figuring out if I could make do without my day job salary. And that was, that was basically what happened. So, I, you know, I mean, you guys know this, but like websites make money the same way television shows and magazines and newspapers do. They just sell ads alongside the content. And so the more popular the show, magazine, readership is, you know, the more money there is to be made. But you guys know this. You've got Google ads. <laughs> hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, do you have any, what are some of the best like tips or hints that you would have to cooking in a small kitchen? Um, I actually, I love that question because I, I mean, I have lived in New York for a long time and I didn't cook the whole time and I didn't cook in my dorm room and I didn't, I was not this great motivated young cooker. I think it helps to start with something that you really like hunger, like to be that you're hungry for something specific that you're craving that you don't like. I mean, this is New York city. You can get most foods pretty well, but there is still some where you're like, nobody makes tomato soup the way I like it. Nobody makes this wild rice pilaf. Okay, I'm probably the only one who has weird cravings for wild rice pilaf. Pie? How about pie? But to start with something that you're not getting the way you want, so you'll be super motivated to deal with all the limitations of your tiny kitchen. I mean, tiny kitchens are absolutely annoying, but if you're hungry enough and you want that enough and you're excited enough to make it, I think you'll put up with it. Beyond that, I think that you should clear your counters, get all the clutter off of them. Like, forget the coffee maker. You can go out and buy coffee. <laughs> um, you know, put, you can leave on what you want, but I actually just clear the decks. I don't keep anything besides maybe some salt, like pinched dishes um, on my counter at most times. Um, and it really helps you feel like, at least if you have the space, you have enough. And remember that at all your favorite restaurants in the city, they are working with stations about this big too. And they put out like, what, hundreds of meals a night? So we can probably make two. But I think the main thing is to just, just start with one recipe. It doesn't have to be a Smitten Kitchen recipe. Um, on, when I'm Googling for a recipe or looking, I gravitate towards recipes that have comments and reviews. Sometimes it just have one or two outside people saying, oh my god, I made this and it was wonderful. It gives me the confidence to know that I'm not going to totally waste my time. Um, and then just start from there. And then move on to the next thing. And soon you'll have a repertoire of things that you make, that you can make as an alternative to going out or ordering in all the time. I have another um, small kitchen question. Sure. Where do you find the space to store all of your gadgets and things for the kitchen? That's my first question. And then I'm also wondering, um, what are some of your favorite restaurants in New York? Um, I store things in my son's room. <laughs> I, I don't know. Things are just everywhere these days. At one point, I was really good. Like, you know, the New York rule is like one thing in, one thing out. You get a new pan, you have to get rid of an old pan. Or, you know, you get a new sweater, you have to take get rid of an old sweater. Something fell out of balance over the process of me um, writing the book. And I have, like, this stack of stuff in the living room. It looks terrible. It's but beyond that pile of doom, um, I actually, our kitchen is so small and it has like three cabinets. And when we moved in, I realized that I could either keep dishes in there or I could keep food in there. Like I, I knew there was no way I could keep both. And so what we actually did is we got a china cabinet and we put it out in the living room. And so one day it might actually hold china. Now it holds everyday glasses and dishes and flatware. So that's been a big help. The other thing I'm a huge fan of is... Um, get a pot and pan rack, even if my kitchen is so tiny, but I just have a flat one, it's like a rail, and it's um, over the window, um, and you know, just anchor it with like the heaviest, heaviest, strongest, like you're like, oh, I only have 200 pounds of pots, it's okay, get the 500 bolt, you're not gonna be sad about it. And 
get it anchored up really well. And the other thing is I have some space above my cabinets, um, which would normally be a dust and grease trap. It probably still is. But I, I have some of those vertical plate racks or like file folders, and I, I keep a lot of my bakeware up there. So you don't have that stuff cluttering up the closet, um, cu cluttering up your cabinets. So anything you can do to just clear the space out. After that, it's really just about deciding if you really need two peelers or you really need like eight knives. Like maybe you don't need a knife block, maybe just one knife will do. So after that, it's just choices <laughs> and yelling sometimes because it is really annoying. Wait, did you have a second question? Is that was it? My second question was, what are some of your favorite New York restaurants? Hmm. Well, on the way over here, we were talking about Wallace, <laughs> which is this probably not terribly popular. It's like Austrian, German, um, Kurt Gutenbrunner. I mean, the, the, um, he's got other places in the city that are more exciting, but I love going there for this time of year. Good bib, lettuce salad, pumpkin seed oil, and the schnitzel is fantastic. Um, I don't have a, a go-to favorite right now. I'm mean, Perla is really good in the West Village. I don't know. Just there, you know. I think like most New Yorkers, there are places I gravitate into my in my neighborhood. You know, like I live in the East Village, and like I love the Redhead for fried chicken. Um, but I don't have I don't have an all over favorite restaurant. But I'm happy to audition one and come back to you with a suggestion. Hi. Hi, um, I love your blog. I make tons of your recipes, and what I love about Thank it is you. that it's arranged by ingredients. So when I'm like, oh, I have a butternut squash, what should I make? Or I have too many pears, then I know I can go and find something to do with it. But what I've found is with all of your baked good recipes, strangely, I always have to add more liquid. And what I'm wondering is, what am I doing wrong? Like, what what is going on that, <laughs> that this is happening? Do you mean like shortbread? Because I mean, you should you should check out the scone section where everybody complains that everything's too sticky. So. <laughs> Um, do you mean like a crumbly shortbread type um, stuff? Or? So the first recipe of yours that I made, uh, I remember this actually, it uh -huh. was um, the everyday raspberry cake uh -huh. that I make all the time now. It's like it's just like a like a thin sheet cake and you put fruit like in. Oh, right. In that came out dry? It When I looked at the batter, I was like, this is like a cookie oh, dough. It, yeah, had, it is. So actually, those are the best. It's, it's actually intentionally that way. Really? So when, you, um, when you're making, um, you'll probably, if you, have you ever made the blueberry muffins too? They're so thick, it's like a cookie dough. So the trick is, one of the things that I, I read a lot in the comments is people hate it when fruit sinks in cakes. And actually, the trick is to have thicker batters. Um, I mean, people say, if you read one of your mom's recipes, it'll probably tell you to dust it and dust the fruit and flour before it goes in. And it helps a little bit, but actually it's thicker batters that spread nicely and it pulls the moisture from the fruit as it cooks. So they're actually intentionally, um, a good thick batter usually works out really nicely, especially if it has fruit in it. It bakes up to be a good tender consistency. I never gave it a chance. I just added more milk because I was like, there's no No, way. no, 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 no. Bake it up. Bake it up. It's fine. <laughs> That's a good one. No, it's, it's actually like, it's like a yellow cake and it has this extra, you know, moisture, which is the juices from the um, raspberry. So it keeps the fruit from sinking and it also gives it a really nice crumb because you have all that fresh fruit in there that would add a lot of wetness. Otherwise, it can get a little soggy. Um, but so actually, I, I like when I see good thick cake batters that spread nicely because they usually work out really well and have a nice crumb. But it, was there another one? Um, I, I mean, I'm just uh, trying to I remember. I am here to not, help you. <laughs> thank you. I made, um, I made your rhubarb muffins with the uh -huh. crumb topping. Super thick, too. Yeah. I'll Especially, and it's the same thing. It was um, the rhubarb, the blueberry muffins, like all of them, the plum ones in the book. The idea is to um, actually intentionally thick, but it gets the moisture from the fruit as it bakes, and it, the fruit shouldn't sink. So the problem is I just have not been having enough faith. You should, just, you, should trust, you should trust me. You should have faith. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I understand why you wouldn't trust me not knowing me, but I'm, I'm, I can tell you that part is at least intentional. <laughs> um, I was wondering how many times you make a recipe to consider it tested. Oh, I haven't tested them. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I have to stop saying that. People aren't really laughing. Um, so um, I um, it can really range. If I'm starting from like that raspberry cake that she mentions, actually an old gourmet recipe, and it's fantastic. I think I made that twice because it's just, it's a good recipe. I didn't want to change anything. It was just really great. That would be something I'd put on the side. If, for the book, it was, um, I was stepping a lot further out of my comfort zone. And so it was often things I'd never made or never seen before. I wanted, I'm not going to ask you to buy a book full of things that you already know how to make. Um, so I would, it could be anywhere from, 
I would say a minimum of six times to there are things that, I mean, the lemon bars in there, I think I like completely went nuts. I think I made them like 18 times. The fig challah, there were things where I was like really stuck on one part where I just, I just felt like it was this kink that wasn't ironed out. And so I wouldn't, I didn't want to publish it unless I was a hundred percent about it. So it could any, it could really range. <laughs> there were recipes I couldn't even look at for like six months because I was so tired of testing them. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, aside from number of tries, um, like what's your process of creating a recipe? Like how do you go about, do you like look at a recipe and start to hack it or do you just think of something you want and you already know the ratio? I'm very curious. <laughs> you know, it really can depend. Um, it can be sometimes like, you know, I want to make, okay, I got this like weird idea a couple months ago and I haven't been in my kitchen that much since I started the book tour. So we'll get to that in January. But um, I love rye bread toast with breakfast and I love English muffins. So I was like, I want to make rye bread English muffins. So this is the idea I have in my head. The first thing I would probably do is I would probably Google it. And I think what I will probably find is that nobody has my weird taste in this and um, it doesn't exist. So from there, I've made English muffins a few times and I've also made rye bread. So I might take um, a couple of these recipes and sort of mash them together. I actually do type up, like I write a recipe, like including every detail that I could possibly think that'll come up. I try to get my best guess of what I think will be a working, functioning recipe, print it up, stick it to my fridge with a magnet. I've got a cup of pens up there. Take notes as I'm going, adding adjustments or, oh my God, never make this again with a big scribble over it. Um, let's say I do find that somebody's made it. I might look at the recipe and say, is this really what I want to make? Is this close? Um, if it looks really close, I might just make it word for word. And if it's exactly the same, say, hey, by the way, you should make Peter Reinhardt's rye bread English muffins. They're amazing. And if it if I make it and it's quite far off from what I wanted, um, that's when I'll start tweaking and it goes into additional rounds. Mm -hmm. um, so it can depend. Um, it depends on how obscure it is, I guess. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. I was wondering if there was a particular recipe or a few recipes that were your favorite or that you thought were most memorable. In the book or on the site? On the Overall, oh, ever. <laughs> me too is a favorite. So I tend to think of food very seasonally, like the things I want to cook in December are so different from what I want to cook in January. And so, like, did you hear, like, I was like, oh, English muffins, that's January. Don't ask me why. It's just this is how I have, how I am in my head. When I think of, like, a wholesome breakfast bun, I think of, like, January. And when I think of, like, decadent French toast, I think of Mother's Day. So I don't know. That's just me. So for right now, for this month, um, I am all about, as most people are, holiday cooking, heavy roast. I think the short ribs in the book are like so great for like a good holiday party because they keep really well. Like you could make them a day or two before a party. There are brown butter mashed potato. No, was that with the brown? That has the parsnip puree, but you can use the brown butter mashed potatoes from the meatloaf. So I definitely um, think a lot more about heavier roasty meats this time of year. If you're vegetarian, I highly recommend you do not let the month go by before you make mushroom bourguignon because it's such a great way to get that amazing bourguignon flavor um, without having to you know, eat beef or cook beef for several hours with very exacting steps. And of course, cookies. Um, you gotta bake cookies this time of year. And I love, um, I love the, uh, the gooey cinnamon squares in the book are my, like the book was done and they were like, could you stop adding recipes? I'm like, just one more. And that was the last one they let me sneak in. I felt it was like, we have to put these in. And they're basically, you do it in a pan and it is, um, the bottom is a snickerdoodle and the top is like a layer from gooey butter cake. It's a St. Louis thing. And the top has the cinnamon sugar that you would normally roll the snickerdoodles in. So it's just like butter, vanilla, cinnamon, butter vanilla, cinnamon, and then in tiny squares. So um, you, you, it tastes like a toasted marshmallow on top. OK, you guys are going to make them, right? <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> Hi. Hi. After you had so many hundreds of recipes on your blog, how were you able to come up with all new recipes for your book? And what was the time frame like in developing those? And then also, like, wasn't it a little bit heartbreaking to not be able to include some of the ones off of your blog in the book? So what was your name? Michelle. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question was, 
how did I, I, so I don't know, the ideas, they just come. I don't know where they come from. I mean, I would say that if I wake up one day and I have like, I don't feel like cooking anything, I have no new ideas, like it's just time to go back and revisit an old favorite or go out and like refill the proverbial well. I mean, we all hit walls sometimes and it usually it's just fatigue or you're working too hard or you haven't taken enough of a break. If I've actually cooked four days in a row, I don't even want to look at a kitchen. I do not cook every day. I cook some days. I cook when I feel like it. <laughs> That sounds really bratty. Um, but, you know, it's if, if, especially, if, I mean, for, for non-dinner needs to be on the table and we're hungry, like, it's a creative process. And so you have to sort of not push too hard. But I actually keep a very, this is the Google Docs, I have a very, very long list. I have a document called Cook This, and it is pretty much every recipe idea I've ever had, usually sorted by seasons or months or holidays. Um, and when I say sorted, it's very loosely organized. <laughs> um, but it, it might just be anything from those rye English muffins to like a salad I didn't get to, something that didn't make it into the book, things that are partially made that might link to another document with the full recipe in it. It's a labyrinth. Um, so it can, um, so that, I just try to jot things down and I use the notes function on my phone all the time when I'm on the road. Um, you, the next, I'm sorry, your second question was about. What was the, what was the time frame like for de developing everything? You said, I guess you I said, said the, it was the book supposed was to be years. six months, yeah. but that's, that, don't, don't do what I did. I missed every deadline. I think I missed like two major deadlines. Like I started to get threats. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. I'm sure that my editor has some gray hairs because of me. Um, but so I ended up, I thought I could finish it in six months. I had no idea what I was doing. Always give yourself more time than you need. You're not going to be sad to have it. You know, you want it. This is like your baby. You should do it properly. Um, and so I ended up probably getting it in about a year and a half late. No big deal year and a half or so. Um, and sorry, you asked one more question, and I'm not usually this forgetful. I just asked if there were any, anything from the Oh. Like, the Sometimes I'm like, I have something on the side. I'm like, oh, this is so good. It would have been so great for the book. But like, you know, I guess I could always decide, not this week, not next week, but maybe at some point I will consider writing another book and it could fit in. Or maybe one day, like, a best of the site, you know, could always happen. But I don't generally feel that by putting things on the web, I'm losing out. I, I really, I mean, I know that for some people, like their books are the center of their career. There are some food personalities this show is. Like for me, it's really that website. And so and I never feel like I'm giving anything away for free or um, missing a chance to sell it to people or something like that. Because I feel like, I mean, in general, I mean, the, anything on the site is always going to get more eyeballs than a book, so I'm happy to have things there. But maybe one day there will be a collection. And I mean, like, at the rate I have, like, it took me three years to write this book. Can you imagine how long it would take me to get that done? <laughs> a decade. Hi. Hi. So I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, so you mentioned that you knew uh, in the book you've made some recipes six times or like 18 times. So how do you like stay motivated after you mess something up to do it again? Because I find that when I try a recipe and it goes wrong, I'm just so deflated. I'm like, oh, now I'm just going to order pizza because I don't feel like cooking it again. Or you know, I <laughs> That is exactly what I do, by the way. I get totally pissy and I storm out of the kitchen in a huff and I angry text my husband. I'm like, this is terrible. Hope you're picking up pizza on the way home. And I totally, I'm like, a, I'm do not handle things well. So don't worry about it. But yet you, so. you still make them like Eventually, the Eventually, you know, and, and sometimes I don't get back to things. Like depends on what, depends on, like if, if I feel like it was centrally at fault or like even it came out correctly, but it tasted terrible. You know what I mean? Like back to the drawing board. Other times it's just like, I need to take a break from it and come back, and I've done that a lot. There are definitely there are things that never made it into the book because I wasn't really ready to revisit them in time. And then they've actually a lot of them have ended up on the site since then. Um, there are some Dijon braised Brussels sprouts that I was like dying to put in the book, and I just I made them like twelve times, and they were just never right. And all I needed to do was stop working on it, <laughs> take a break, and come back and be like right, I was doing the sauce all wrong, like I was making this too complicated. And then I made them and it was like literally one round before I felt like they were ready for the site um, after 12 rounds of pulling my hair out. Another one is um, there's strawberry and cream biscuits on the site. And for some reason, I, I met, met, intended them for the book, but I was like, 
I don't know. They had, like had annoyed me. I felt like they weren't interesting, and I felt that they hinged too strongly on having really freshly picked strawberries, and I felt like that's kind of an unfair thing to put in a book that's supposed to be year round. I mean, obviously fresh produce is always best, but there's really a difference between the strawberries that you pick and the strawberries you can buy in December. And I didn't want like most people to be unhappy with it. And also, I felt so. Anyway, there are a lot of things where um. I just don't, I, I don't come back to it or I come back to it years later. And that's where the list comes in because I can always revisit something when I feel like and not feel like I have to work on that until it's done. So my other question is, since you started blogging, um, has that kind of ruined like going out to restaurants for you? Where you go to a restaurant, you're like, I could make this at home. Why would change this? <laughs> and I would make this better. Do you ever think that? Uh, not at all, actually. I still love going out because I just like the, and I like to just turn off the cooking brain and like just get to try new flavors. Like I usually like picking something very weird on the menu that doesn't sound very good because why would they have it on the menu unless, I mean, everybody has roast chicken and steak on the menu, but it's when you hear like turnip gratin and pasta that you're like, wow, I bet that's good or they wouldn't be trying to sell it. So that's, and I get a lot of ideas from going out. Okay, fine. It's kind of hard for me to buy muffins at coffee shops. They're really terrible for the most part. And, and I would say in almost all cases, you can do better at home. There are a few exceptions, but I would say that breakfast baked goods are hard to get excited about outside my own kitchen. But beyond that, everything else, I'm so happy somebody else is cooking. I'm like, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Um, as somebody who's been blogging for a really long time about food, um, do you have any opinions on Pinterest or how this has affected your site or the process of figuring out stuff at all? Um, this is such a good question. Um, Pinterest hasn't actually changed anything for me. I'm, um, I, I think it's great. Um, I don't use it that much personally. Like I don't pin my other my recipes, but I make them pinnable. Um, I. Um, I don't, it hasn't really caused any static for me. I know there are a lot of people in the beginning who felt like, you know, there are certainly some copyright issues. Is that what you meant? Or you well, just mean copyright good for Did it like increase your um, traffic or do you feel like? I think it has actually. I mean, I, I, my general feeling with new tech, I sound like an old fogey, but I'm like with new technologies that have emerged since I started blogging, is I actually like to meet people where they are. As long as it's no real trouble for me, like when when everybody was gravitating towards Facebook, God, this makes me sound like an old blogger, I set up a Facebook page. I post a link to new recipes there. When a lot of people wanted to find out about new recipes through Twitter, I created a Twitter feed that just updates mm -hmm. Recipes. Then, then why don't you have a Pinterest board? Um, well, I do have a Pinterest. Just well, to me, there's a totally set different process from. I don't. I. I kind of think Pinterest is better when it's not just site owners pinning their own stuff, like somebody else usually does. Um, so I can. I don't usually do that. In terms of me personally using Pinterest, like to uh, use bookmarks, I just. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm very resistant to it. I do. I do actually have a board. For some reason, there's this thing. I had this. This is just like a personal thing, but I. Um, I don't. I try not. I. I feel like I would probably just create a collection of things that I wanted to buy and like either couldn't afford or I felt like it was sort of unhealthy for me to just collect wants and needs and whatever. That sounds weird. Yeah. Um, but so in general, I, I personally, just because I know I would just pin like really expensive stuff that I don't really need to be spending my money on. Um, but at the same time, I love looking at Pinterest and other people's boards for inspiration. Like as an artsy, farty person, I love to follow like design people and just see what they're finding. Um, but I, I actually, I think it's been great for sites. I think visual, I mean, especially with food blogging, like visual bookmarks are, are important thing. And I know a lot of food bloggers have changed the way they do their photos to have captions on them in the photo, but I just don't want to mess up the photos that way. So I haven't changed, I haven't changed that. I don't want to. Hi. Hi. So it sounds like you do most of your research, uh, online. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you feel about more traditional, like the joy of cooking or older books or what's in your library? Um, I love cookbooks. <laughs> um, I, I, I am. I'm on the computer, so it tends to be like the place that I look first, but it depends on what I'm looking for. I mean, I am like a huge fan of, I am. I believe that everybody needs mastering the art of French cooking in their library. I have La Russe. I have The Joy of Cooking. I have a lot of the classics. And then I have new books I pick up like each season. So there are a whole bunch of books I've picked up this month. I've been spending a lot of time in bookstores. And so I have been picking, every time I go, I like pick up a new book. And so I love using cookbooks. I almost prefer cookbooks for reading. I feel like the recipes that come in the kitchen with me are usually like 
more often from a website or something that jumped out at me from a book. But for the books, I, I like to like read them in bed. <laughs> I like to look, it's like looking at a beautiful magazine. Like I want to read, I wish they weren't so heavy. I'd read them on a plane. <laughs> so I, I really like, love cookbooks for reading, especially because it's more of an organized thing. You know, with the web, you only get what you ask for from it, you know, whatever it retrieves back based on your request. But with a book, you end up, um, I keep thinking of this Roots book I picked up this fall, and it's like, you know, living in a cold climate, as most of us do. Um, we pretty much, the only fresh food, vegetables we have all winter from green markets are root vegetables. And I don't really know, I have a bunch of things I like to do with each, but this is like 200 recipes and it's stunning. And they're just, each page is like this new idea. So when you are at the market and all they have is turnips, wow, here's eight recipes that are like really original for it. So that's a really, that one I've been thumbing through when I'm supposed to be sleeping. <laughs> um, so I do, I really love it. And I, I feel like Buying cookbooks is almost like buying beloved art books, you know, especially with so many of them having so many beautiful photos these days. There's a place for all of them. Well, maybe not in my apartment, but I keep buying them anyway. <laughs> no more questions? Yeah, ask. <laughs> Um, so I really like the disasters section of your blog. Um, I think it's really funny that, that you put up the recipes that like, totally fail, and they still have these like gorgeous pictures. That look really nice. um, and I'm just curious, like, how many things do you cook that you're like, this definitely goes in the disaster pile? Or do you do them like numerous times and fail over and over again before they make it there? Or how to um, decide? So yeah, so in the early days of the site, I had this disasters category. And I mean, I haven't, and I used to, um, if I just made something that was an utter flop, I was like, Martha, like, I can't believe you did this to me. This is the worst recipe ever. And it was like that. And I've stopped populating it so much. <laughs> For a couple of reasons. One, people would make it anyway, and they'd be like, this was terrible. I'm like, I just, I don't, I told you that, but it doesn't matter. And I felt bad that people were having disasters because of me. I don't want them to associate my site with failures um, in their kitchen. The other part is, I, I guess I started, like, as readership grew, I felt a lot bad, like, worse, like, kind of calling people out and being mean about terrible recipes. Like, I'll say it, but for me, I feel like it's far more useful for me these days to make the recipe work and say, this recipe did not work the way it was printed. Here are a lot of changes I made, but not just leave people at a dead end. So I don't do it as much, but there are plenty of disasters. That does not mean that we do not have failures. They usually, by the time they're on the site, they've I've done something with them, or I'll say, I made this soup, and it was utterly revolting. Like, it was pureed spinach water like I did. It was really gross. Here's something that I think is a lot better. Here's how I changed it. So I try to lead it to a positive, like a happy ending, like a romantic comedy um, at the end, um, just so it's more useful for people than just complaining. Um, so yeah, but it was sort of fun to have a collection of things that were just awful, because I'm sure it happened. Hi. Hi. Um, is there any chef or cook that you consider your culinary hero? Oh, man. Um, I'm not a big chef follower. One of my favorite restaurants in New York City was, before it closed, was Tabla. Um, I love it, and I loved everything Floyd Cardo's touched. I thought it was, like, perfect. And so, of course, I followed him downtown, and I've been to um, North and Grill a couple times, and it's just as amazing, because I think it's the chef, you know, I mean, he is what transforms these ingredients in a very specific way, so that was definitely one of my favorites. I love um, Michael Anthony, I think he was up at Stone Barns before, and he's at Gramercy Tavern now, so there are definitely some names that have stuck out to me at restaurants where I've had good meals, and I often realize that I ate at their other restaurant at some point, but I I um, I do tend to follow chef names more than I follow actual restaurant, pro you know, projects that means a lot more to me to like know who's cooking there. Like I mentioned this Wallace place, this Kurt Grutenbrunner. Well, I mean, his personality aside, um, <laughs> he's got a lot of he, he makes a lot of the food that I like to eat. So I wouldn't say I have one like David Chang level like chef worship, like some name in the stars. Um, Though, you know, who doesn't like Momofuku? <laughs> I live in the East Village, so it's like Chang is like all around at all times. Um, so I don't have one, but there are definitely names that jump out for me more that mean a lot. And of course, especially when they've had a cookbook, like um, Sunday Supper is at Luke's, at Luke's? Luke's? 
Luke's um, from Susan Go, and I always pronounce her name wrong. She's out in L LA, but like after that, that cookbook is one of my favorite cookbooks. And so then of course going to the restaurant is so much more meaningful knowing how she speaks and you know, writes recipes in a whole collection. That was not very articulate, but yeah, there are some. <laughs> Do you have a favorite chef? Um, I'm a big fan of all the Nice. He makes, for home cooking, like he is at, I don't, does he even have, he doesn't have restaurants, right? He's just a home cook guy. She's got a cookbooks and, and grape juice. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. He makes amazing recipes for home cooks. Like I think like he, Ina, Cooks Illustrated, they're like, I mean, if you're a home cook and trying to figure out where to start, those are the places. Thank you. <laughs>